live. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. I'm delighted to welcome, as I always am, a debut author. So much fun. So it's nice that you all have come out to meet her. This is Chris. How do we pronounce it? We pronounce it Freezewick. Like it is freeze, <laughs> which is something you guys don't do a lot of out here. Only in the bookstore <laughs> <laughs> when the staff has been at the at the temperature controls. Right. Okay. So it is Freezewick, and the Ghost Manuscript is your first novel. That but is, is it? Is it? Have you written anything before? I have. Yes. Um, I have a nonfiction. Uh, book that came out, gosh, I guess about 10 years ago, called The Cheap Bastard's Guide to Boston. Uh, it's uh, Very catchy title. I, I know. <laughs> it's, it's part of a really fun series of uh, guidebooks to major cities that basically uh, include everything that's free or extremely cheap to do in these major metropolitan areas. So there's one for New York, there's one for Boston, I believe there's one for DC, there might be one for Phoenix, I'm not entirely sure. So that was my first one. Um, my, I was a humor columnist for many years for the dearly departed Boston Phoenix newspaper, um, and my humor columns were anthologized in two books with other amazing humorists that I can't even believe I got to share a book with. Um, like Dave Barry and Steve Martin and Meryl Marco and just sort of these luminary humorists. Um, so that that is, I wouldn't say that's a book that I wrote, but I, my my work was anthologized in those. So so those that was really fun. But this is the first novel that I've written. Uh, it took me twelve years to write, from sort of conception to birth. Um, birth being April 2nd, which was the day that the book came out. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I, uh, I'm one of those slow burn type of writers, I guess. I'm yeah. hoping that the next one won't take 12 years. Well, yes, I hope it won't too, but I can see that part of it must have been the enormous amount of research that you did for this book. It would have been, there were so many rabbit holes down which one could fall. It's funny that you should use that language. I just had this exact conversation with someone the other day, and I was like, I could have gone down the rabbit hole on any one of the any one of the uh, topic areas in the book: rare books, illicit illicit trade, illicit antiquities trade, um, the history of the British Isles during you know what is referred to as the Dark Ages. Some people don't like that term. It's very apt for what was going on there at, at that time, I believe. Um, but yeah, I mean, I and I and I still do actually uh, collect string. Or, that's a journalism term. It's when you uh, run across articles or um, magazine stories or television shows or movies. You sort of make a note so you can go back and review it. And I sort of have these huge um, uh, 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 Evernote files filled with stuff that I keep on collecting because it's such a habit after 12 years I can't stop. Uh -huh. Well, um, what drew you to, because this is almost a treatise on rare manuscripts, um, a library, how to, how to authenticate them, how to um, catalog them, how to preserve them. What drew you to that? I mean, did you hang out at the Morgan, or um, I, you know, well, you're I mean, a library I, junkie? I am a, I am a huge library junkie. I am a, um, a rare book junkie. I'm an old, an, an, uh, an ancient book junkie. The first time I saw the Codex Sinaiticus at the British Library, I was just like, this thing is 1,500 years old, and it looks like it was written yesterday. It's on parchment, which is a type of goatskin that's been specially treated um, and it was the paper of, you know, the, for about a, gosh, I got 800 years before somebody realized you could create paper out of cotton. Um, and the clarity of the writing and the, the penmanship of the person who wrote it, these tiny, tiny little letters, because they had to economize, because the parchment was extremely difficult to create. Um, and it was the first, gosh, I'm going to mess this up, but I, I believe the Codex Sinaiticus was the first Hebrew Bible, and it was written about 1,500 years ago. And it literally looks like it was written yesterday in fresh ink. It, it's unbelievable. And it just caught my imagination that, that something could be that permanent and that indelible. Um, and what else is out there that we don't know? What other books are out there that we don't know about and that 
have sort of this well, book has many many sort of idea many things are the uh, the impetus for this book but that was one of them it's just this idea that like physical books physical you know not electronic electronics can be deleted instantly and there and then knowledge is gone but like a, a really um, a collection of ancient manuscripts and what the knowledge is that's in there that we can't even maybe even read because it's in another language. It's just so, but when you mind. say manuscript, it doesn't necessarily have to be a codex like this. It could actually be a scroll. I mean, there are different forms. Um, a codex, plural codices, um, was came along somewhat after. Um, Correct. In fact, we started out with clay, you know, and that sort of thing. I mean, I get lost in these rabbit holes too, but I really enjoy them. Um, when you call this book the ghost manuscript, there is a feature of old parchment when it's reused. That is really interesting um, in that to use it over again, they try to like scrape it or clean it or something and then reuse it because it is, A, it is reusable, which is really good, um, and B, it, as you say, it was so expensive and so difficult, but then sometimes the older stuff shows through. And that is, um, so there's a couple of reasons why I, I named this the ghost manuscript. The primary one is because there's an actual ghost in the book, and the second one is because that is a term that some people use in the industry to describe what is called a palimpsest, which is one of right. these books that is erased by someone who wants to use it for something they deem to be more important than whatever it is that's in it already. And then with with modern technology that we currently have, there are a variety of types of uh, x-ray technologies that can actually read what's behind it. And when uh, collectors or uh, rare book authenticators realize they have one of these things, it's extremely exciting because it's like, the, the, the language that you can read easily is very old to begin with. And then when you realize there's something behind it, you're like, oh my gosh, it could be another five or 600 years older than what's already in there, you know? So so for, for collectors and authenticators and librarians, rare book librarians, it's like hitting the jackpot when you encounter one of these things and they call it a ghost, they call it a ghost manuscript, so. Right, well, in actuality, it's more likely that you will come across something lost in a plump set than you ever would, you know, just finding it in somebody's country house attic, which is kind of, um, and in fact, it is modern technology that gives us hope that we can find more of those. It's like painting, you know, they're able now to x-ray paintings and determine all kinds of things. It'll be really interesting to see when they go about trying to restore Notre Dame, what they might find behind mm -hmm. some of the, the paintings that survived, which they probably wouldn't have messed with until they have reached this new and delicate state. But, um, you know, overpainting is a um, sort of a, not, not a surprise anyway, in, in the art world. And as we get better and better x-ray techniques and so forth, I mean, otherwise we'd never been able to read um, the um, the manuscripts discover I'm going blank on the name, but you know what I mean. The the SC community where they found the the clay. Oh, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I know. Yeah, sorry, I'm having a senior going. moment. I know. <laughs> go ahead, laugh. It just happens to me. Um, but the Dead Sea Scrolls would be virtually impossible for anyone to read if it weren't for modern technology. Be oh, Beatrice, you're here. Hi. Yeah, hi. <laughs> this is Beatrice Williams, one of our author who's joined us. Um, and one of your favorite subjects we're yes. talking about. I know, it's so yeah. exciting. Um, anyway, um, that's just one of the of the interesting features of the book. So if you're at all interested in rare manuscripts and all this kind of thing, that's really fun. But obviously that's not going to power a thriller, right? Or we spend all our time in the library. I don't know. I that. think rare manuscripts are extremely well. thrilling, but I don't think everyone else would. I think I'd be by myself on that. No, you wouldn't, but it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it certainly wouldn't have the momentum of your story. So second, um, we learn a lot about the history, as you say, of England during, what, what time period are you assigning? It's easier to call it the Dark Ages than keep referring to centuries. Well, the, the trouble with the, the phrase is two things. One, um, the, the Dark Ages, or what people consider to be a quote-unquote dark age vary dramatically depending on what region you're talking about. And also the time period changes too. Um, scholars 
some scholars, especially in the British Isles, consider it to be roughly 400 to 700 when the transition from a Roman, uh, a Roman occupied British Isles, the Romans left in the early 400s. They basically abandoned their citizens. They, they had become very Romanized, the people in the British Isles at that time. And then the Anglo-Saxons who had initially been asked to come to help battle of various internecine imperial tribal stuff that was going on, the Romans took off and they were like, well, this place is great, we should take it over. And they basically just proceeded to ravage and pillage the entire eastern portion of the United Kingdom, what's now the United Kingdom, and plunge the area into a truly dark age. They were, they were illiterate, they did not write, they did not have that sort of extremely verbose uh, uh, way that the Romans did, the Romans documented everything, I mean everything. Like if you basically like gave someone a quarter, they would document that in some sort of a parchment somewhere. Um, everything, their prayers, their wishes, their, their, their entreaties to the gods, all of it was written down. And then between 400 and 700 AD, the amount of documentation being created, whether it be a stone tablet, whether it's a parchment, whether it's a scroll, whether it's a, a manuscript, plummeted because the Anglo-Saxons did not have a writing tradition. True, I've always thought the real, well, not the real tragedy, the major tragedy of the period was that they didn't take care of the plumbing. The Romans, <laughs> I'm serious, the Romans were really good. Yeah, that's why it's called bath. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, um, exactly. And right. you know, so I, when I say, I'm always thinking this is a time when sanitation took a hike. <laughs> and you, <laughs> you know, know, not for nothing, but it probably led directly to the various plagues and and, and epidemics that rapidly followed. Um, I'm sure it got to a great part. The Romans were... were um, what have the a... Romans ever done for us? Anyone? Monty Python? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the uh, time period that I specifically deal with in the book, or that my characters are interested in, is 400 to 700 AD. After 700, the... the, the Anglo-Saxons have taken over. They are they are basically becoming the leadership of the islands. They are becoming the kings and they're the dukes and they're you know the, all the various tribal factions are sort of slowly accepting the fact that this is going to be their new world order. And then they became uh, the descend the descendants of they are the ancestors of the current monarchy basically. And, and you know that that blood runs through that the monarchy. So, so why did I go through all this? And the answer is, you'll be interested to know, that part of this novel depends upon this period because did King Arthur exist? And if he did, are there any records of him? And where might he be, you know, where might he be buried if he was a real person? And on and on. And what Chris has described is one reason there is this ever question about him because people weren't able to write things down. So, you know, it's a... It's a lot of folk memory, a lot of oral tradition. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the same thing about Troy, basically. You know, um, Homer Homer's tales were um, were oral and depended on uh, mono, How do I say it? Monomic. You know what I mean? Mon Monomic. Monomic. Yes. I never can remember the word. Anyway, <laughs> um, and so over time, you know, those kinds of things can um, can lose accuracy and sort of become myth. So you decided that you would take, what's the name of your lead character? You made her Welsh, obviously. Harris Jones. Her Harris. Harris Jones. She is a Welsh, her father is Welsh, Welsh, her mother's American. She's a rare book authenticator. She works for a large auction house in Boston. And she... With an unscrupulous and sinister boss. Yeah, kind of a, an idiot, mean, an idiot bad guy. Yes. Um, which we know has populated some auction houses. <laughs> yes. We already know those, right? Yes, so he's yes. not a completely. He's a great salesperson, but he wouldn't know like a Peanuts comic book from a. Well, it wasn't that so much as yeah. his distinct lack of ethics that is, uh, you know, important to this. So Karis, and he, he, says, he's he, he really sets the whole thing in motion. Right. Um, her biggest client, who she helped to amass the biggest collection of. British Dark Age manuscripts on Earth has been uh, confined to an insane, a, 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 an insane asylum. No one knows what's wrong with him. And his son has decided to sell his entire library and a house that 
that he lives in. And Karis is called in to authenticate it for, for a sale. Well, um, and, and that's in part because she helped acquire she helped, so much she of it. So she's of really it. kind of a shortcut in the right. sense that she's familiar with the she's familiar with the collection, and as as we know, anytime there's a sale of a library, there's usually a catalog that identifies every single piece that's in that library. So her job as a rare book authenticator is to make sure that everything that's outlined in the catalog is physically present in the library and is actually what it says it is. Um, along. She goes to the library, she starts to authenticate, she comes across a catalog that's not list, she comes across a catalog that, or an index that basically starts cross-referencing all the books in this library and she recognizes the index terms as things related to King Arthur and she's massively, massively disappointed because she's like, seriously, King Arthur, are you kidding me? I just spent like 10 years of my life helping this man amass this huge collection of Dark Age manuscripts, and he was interested in finding King Arthur, and she's just like, oh my god, I'm just like, what am I doing with my life? Over the course of the beginning of the book, you find out that there's a book in the library that isn't in any catalog, and that the man who, his name is John Harper, he's a former tech billionaire, now in a very high-end psychiatric facility, he's convinced that that book points the way to the tomb of King Arthur, and it was written by King Arthur's personal priest in real time as he was going through his exploits during the Dark Ages, 400, well, the specific time period would have been like approximately 490 to 530 AD. Now, I want to backtrack a little bit. King Arthur has become, as we all know, this enormous legend went up here, lines a lot, round table, blah, blah, blah. He was inspired by a real human being. His legend was inspired by a real human being. And all research that I was able to um, unearth indicates that he was most likely a general that was formerly a Roman soldier or, or, or they, called, they called him the Duke of War in many documents that I was able to, um, to read. But he was probably someone that led battles against the Anglo-Saxon hordes and helped keep them in the eastern portion of the country. They never actually made it all the way to Cornwall and Wales. They stopped because of a huge battle, battle that some believe was the Battle of Mons Badonicus, Mount Baden. That's a very famous battle that's very linked to Arthurian legend. But there's a lot of evidence that that battle actually took place and that it was actually a turning point that basically stopped the hordes really right at right. the right Which is at one the reason that both Cornwall and Wales preserved a Celtic heritage Correct. where the rest of England didn't. So it, it actually does make sense that there was something that, you know, called a halt. And there were, and there's many, many theories about who this Arthurian inspiration could have been. There are some people that believe that he ended up in, uh, in what is now France. There are some people that believe he ended up in what is now Cornwall. As a, as a fiction writer, I had to pick a lane and stick with it, uh, basically. And everyone's like, well, you're at research, you know, if you've missed this. You, and I was like, no, I didn't miss it. I just had to, I had to decide which version of Arthur I wanted my Arthur to be. And I also wanted my Arthur to be a, aligned with a lot of other things that, were go, that are going on in, in this book that, that, so that we could tell a rousing tale and put my uh, character Karis into great peril. And, uh, and have her uh, problem solved. That was a big priority for me when I was sitting down to write this book. I wanted my lead character to be a normal woman like me, who was like, doesn't have superpowers and doesn't have like a specially trained eagle that swoops in and knocks guns out of people's hands and stuff. And like, you know, didn't wasn't a former <coughs> Navy SEAL or anything like that. I just wanted her to be just like a chick. You know? <laughs> but she really isn't. She has a very odd personality, and, and in fact, I have to Don't say... Don't we all, though? <laughs> well, speak for yourself. <laughs> I, found it, I found it difficult to warm up to her. Um, you're supposed to. I know. I realize that you're manipulating me, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, nonetheless, as we gradually learn more about her, the reasons for her behavior become more obvious. But, I mean, she is not... Um, She's not I, a warm and fuzzy. No, she, well, no. And actually, only somebody like her, I think, um, 
could I mean, basically, this is this is like a quest, you know, or a treasure hunt. It's um, only somebody like her, I think, could actually undertake it. And and part of the reason for that is like she prefers books to people, and so when a wise she... woman, <laughs> sex. <laughs> sorry, I have always thought years ago I belonged to a book club, and it was really interesting. There was one other woman that liked me, and then there were various other women, and the other woman like me said to me one day, she said. It matters, she said, you know, when we're done, they all want to rush off to lunch or they're, you know, they're dashing off to play bridge or something. She said, you and I are going home to read. Right, I said, you know, and the truth is the world is divided into people who read and people who don't. I'm absolutely convinced. And it's almost an unbridgeable gap, you know. That's for sure. It really is. Uh, my husband will tell you a story because he just couldn't believe it. Years and years ago, I probably told some of you this at our other smaller bookstore over on Main Street, right in front of the cash desk, was the, the brown leather chair, which is a relic now, 20 years old. So it was right there, so you could see it. And in came this collector from Boston, who was just a real bookophile, with his wife, or the bibliophile, for the first time. So she sat down in the chair, and he and I went skipping around, because I was trained to follow him, sort of like the doctor with the scrub nurse, that's how he liked doing it. Um, so I would follow him down the aisle, and he would be doing all this, and finally this voice spoke up. Saul, she said, you have a book. And, you know, it was just like she totally didn't get it. She had no idea what was going on. Um, and, but but it, was, it illustrated my point, you know, that he was in his universe, and she was over here. And then I often wondered, how did they get along uh, when he really would rather have been with his books or whatever, um, what did she do? And did they, how did they, you know, communicate? I mean, I think well, it's very know, hard to live with a non-reader if you're you know, a reader. It's really interesting that you mention that because that dynamic between John Harper, the tech billionaire, right. who is also obsessed with his books yeah. and his wife is a key relationship right. In well, the book. I, that's why I brought up. Yeah, Saul, you have like a book. You just, <laughs> yeah, you right. just, you just nailed it. I mean, that 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 actually ends up being kind of one of the most important relationships in the book. But it's mimicked in a way between. It's mimicked by Karis's relationship with everybody. She just would be like, you know what? I just, I, I don't want anything to do with any of you. Really messy and complicated. And you talk. I just like, <laughs> really prefer to just hang out with books. You know, they talk back, true. and then one day one starts talking back. I was trying to finish Martin Walker this <laughs> afternoon, and my husband came up to supervise something. <laughs> He's a reader, so he doesn't do this harm. He kept coming in to say, so, you know, finally I just went, ah! and he said to me, wow, I almost incinerated it. <laughs> it's your own fault, I said. You keep interrupting. <laughs> I'm, I'm reaching the climax of this book. Right, so it is a world you get lost in. I mean, it, it truly is. So that part of it, you know, I, I well understand. I do think this was a work of, um, despite all of the anchors we've discussed, a work of great imagination on your part. And so Thank I, you very I, much. I do have a question, which is, did you intend this book to be a single book? Because the way it plays out, you're going to have to write a sequel. I know. <laughs> but I want to know if you designed that or whether it just happened to you in the course of the book. I knew that I wanted, I'd done so much research. And I was like, I would be damned if this is going to be a one and done after all this research. Because there's so much more that could be. Not just in this particular line of plot. Yeah. But but the, the devices, the, you know, the books, the, the various other sort of things that happen in the book. But I, when I was writing the book, I, I wanted it to, to end where one, the major plot arc is resolved. But I also wanted to leave things in play, some things in play, so that people would be like, I really need to see what is going to happen with Karis in the future because... This is someone I want to hang out with again. Um, I didn't. I didn't realize until I was at the end of the book just how the, the, the ending. Some people really have reacted to the ending, which we're not going to. Discuss. Which we're not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm sorry. People have really reacted to it. They either they either are like as usual, 
I completely adore this ending. It's perfect, and I can't wait to see where she goes next. Or, I hate you, Chris Freezewick. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> You're dead to me. Like, so, you know. But I meant it to end the way it did because that was the way it needed to end. Well, I was I'm not quarreling with that. I'm just saying that, you know. For some... sure meant it to be the first in right. at least a three-part thing. But I want it, but I I want them to be obviously discrete right. entities that can stand on their own. But if you come into it in book two, I really want you to want to go back and, re and read book one to find out about her origin. This was really intended as an origin tale. Okay. I say that because... Um, over the years, I can't tell you how many authors have said to me, you know, they wrote a book and then someone said, you know, where's the sequel? And that came as a huge surprise, right? I mean, you've all been here and heard them all say that. So, you know, it isn't always the case that the author has designed a book to continue. They have hoped, in fact, to get this one book published and, you know, that is as far as they got. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I had uh, the great honor of meeting several authors who have uh, written very successful series with a, with a character who comes back over and over again. Um, I interviewed, uh, I'm a journalist by trade, I have been for many years, and for an article I was writing about something completely unrelated to anything we're talking about today, I interviewed Janet Ivanovich. Now, whether you love her work or hate her work, the woman is a machine. She's pumped out like there are 25 or 30 books I can't even keep well, track. Well, there's 25 plums, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, I mean, right. she's just, she's this literally... This is the year of the 20, I think this is the year of the 25th plum. Yeah. So she, so she said, so I was telling her I was working on another book project, and I was like, it's, I, it's killing me. I, I just don't think I'm going to... She's like, you need to, to write something that you can turn into a, to a series. She's like, you would not believe how great that is. You need to think about doing that. And you know, so interestingly, last night, you were here, yeah. last night the very question came up and the wisdom last night was that publishers aren't looking for series and that standalones are um, what's, you Well, know, to be fair, this conversation happened before I started this book, so it was more than 12 years ago. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I think that, that especially in this particular field of fiction that series are very much valued at standalones are too you know and yeah. as I say oftentimes my impression is that authors write a book and they haven't really considered that it might appeal enough that somebody would want a, a second book and then there's a kind of a scramble so I'm, I'm just interested to hear that you but you know as a journalist you probably have a long long vision here yeah I mean this is my job right um, and it's a job that I get to do and I'm so fortunate that I get to do it I get to do it in the nonfiction world and now I get to do it in the fiction world and so uh, I it, it's interesting as a as a journalist life is a series you know you write a story but that story doesn't stop just because you stop writing it right um, and so in a way I think I take a look I bring a little bit of that mindset to fiction as well because in my mind Karis is still alive she's still out there and she's still dealing with the stuff that and I feel kind of bad that I haven't written about her yet because I've been kind of busy <laughs> launching this and doing a book tour but she's like um can we get on with it please <laughs> like let's right. get back to the computer and like start typing girl well, I really like series heroes like this. I like Lincoln Child's Enigmologist, which I think is a wonderful thing that he just made up, but still is really a lot of fun. And Dan Brown still got, who's it, running around looking for, you know, lost treasures and so forth and so on. I mean, doesn't everyone love a treasure hunt? I mean, I love quests. I grew up on stuff like, you know, H. Ryder Haggard and, you know, King Solomon. Does anyone remember King Solomon's finds? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Deborah Kerr and Stuart Granger mm -hmm. out there in Africa. She got the most perfect haircut in the bush with an old pair of scissors. I've always heard every bit. <laughs> I'm so envious. You know? But nonetheless, I mean, I think I think it's really hard to, you know, to, I mean, Duma, if you go back, the Three Musketeers and all that other good stuff. You know, there's a, there's a real propulsion to the narrative in a quest, you know. I mean, it's, it's actually, I had this wonderful conversation years ago with James Lee Burke, who really tastes le mot d'auteur, 
um, you know, the Tales of King Arthur is the inspiration for his Robichaux novels, and we had a, a great conversation about it. And those knights, those guys at the round table, they were all sent out, you know, to on quest to right wrongs or to find stuff or whatever it might be. It's one of, well, it's really the Odyssey, you know, it's one of the, it, it is maybe the oldest form of fiction. So and, it's really yeah. fun to run into it. Um, and who better than a, a person authenticating books and loving books than to, I miss John Dunning. I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, when he got his brain tumor and was forced to stop writing, it's just because, I don't know if you know his books, The Book to Die was one of the most influential books in the crime genre because it was the first time a lot of people even ran into the concept of collectability, what what a first printing might be as opposed to a first edition, because there's a gigantic difference, um, and how to, um, you know, authentic signatures. I mean, he wrote, I'm trying to remember, was it five or either six before he was unable to continue? He went down a rabbit hole having to do with an encyclopedia of old time radio or something, which swamped like five years when he could have been writing more Cliff Janeway, damn. Um, but anyway, you know, we've, it's been a long time since we had like a, a book. There's, um, there is a guy who writes for Viking whose name is escaping me, who also has a, an interest in rare books as the mechanism. Do you remember who he is? Last one was at Oxford. Just can he has very funny titles. They're very bookish, like Dickens. They are Dickens titles, actually. Dickens in. Well, I'm maybe another senior moment who will come to me. But anyway, they're fairly rare, you know, as compared to like police guys and private eyes. And well, that, and again, like that was that was kind of a thing that I wanted to do. Was I wanted a, a, a woman specifically? I wanted her to be kind of screwed up, not specially trained. Obviously, she has knowledge. She has a very specialist uh, uh, career, and she uh, is very well educated. But she doesn't have any particular, you know, weaponry training, or can't, you know, uh, scale tall buildings using chewing gum or anything like that. And so she has to kind of figure it out as she goes along when she gets plunged into this really fast-paced, very dangerous, completely out of the blue uh, uh, hunt while being pursued and that was really fun for me because i i i always the my north star was what would i do if i got thrown into the middle of this like how would i as just a normal person react if xyz um and i feel like there's so many wonderful thrillers but there's very rarely someone who's not a detective not a former navy seal not a former spy you know not a cop not you know a reacher type um yeah. so or 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 a detective or you know i mean i and i i love all of these these genres i love all of these these writers um but i don't see a lot of just average jane not so but just like normal jane person getting thrown into the middle of a thriller novel i'm looking about because i'm trying to find my book by mr Guff. let me see if i can find it i think ah here it is Okay, the hero of this glorious book, which I absolutely love and recommend to you, is um, a film archivist at the Library of Congress. Yay. <laughs> um, my former employer. And um, he gets caught because central to um, what happens is some uh, film footage, archival footage, that has come from East Germany over the wall and the person who smuggled out the film is killed. Mm. And um, Anyway, it takes his special expertise as a film guy uh, in order to bring him into a story. So if your gal, if Karis is going to continue, at some point she'll have to hook up with somebody with actual um, enforcement authority. Yes. You know, well, she, she lacks the power of arrest right, and that's other correct. things. Right? Although she does not in any way lack the power of kicking people's butt. No, <laughs> no, that's very true. But what really <laughs> makes interesting books, I think, and so when you have somebody with an expertise, whether I'm publishing one in September and the, the woman is an odontologist, now you wouldn't think that, you know, a person who does teeth uh, would be all that fascinating, but she's in New Zealand and somebody is um, discovered in a, one of the lava pools. And so he's so obliterated that the only way they can figure out who he might be would be through his teeth. And she'd like to stay in New Zealand, but her visa is expiring, so she... She's a little bit like hers. Um, 
she decides that she'll muscle her way in as an expert so she can extend her work stay. Um, I that sounds fascinating. It is. It's really, it's really very cool. Well, what um, I love about books like that is right. that you actually learn some stuff too. I mean, yes, obviously, exactly. you're assuming that author has done their legwork and learned about the thing they're writing about, or they actually are that. They actually have that uh, knowledge. I, I did not have any rare manuscript or, or um, um, bibliophilia right. uh, uh, knowledge, and so I researched that because it was fascinating. And again, like went so far down the rabbit hole on this stuff um, that I, I mean, and again, I make no, I have no illusions that I approximate the knowledge and the talent pool of people that are actually rare manuscript authenticators, but I know what they need to know. Sure. And well, so, all you have to really do is be convincing. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I've accomplished that. And, and it doesn't hurt to put sources or some sort of um, authentic material in the background. So Beatrice, you were reading Lauren's book today. Yes. And one of the great things about Lauren's book, I won't go to the end in case you haven't finished it yet, is that she does have a wonderful essay at the back about her sources, the books that she read, in order to tell us about the slave rebellion and the cholera epidemics in 19th century Barbados, which is a place we don't normally get to go. And you know, I think that makes it more interesting for the reader if you want to, you don't have to read it, but if you get hooked, you can pursue it with this guide to, um, that, you know, that she includes. So I, I did a little bit of that at the yeah. back of, of Ghost Manuscript because right. obviously I had a lot of interviews, a lot of books that I've read, a lot of source material. Um, but I have two uh, friends who are also have recently published books that are being well uh, reviewed, Age of Light by Whitney Sherr and Leading Men by Chris Castellani. And they have big essays in the back that kind of outlines because those books are based on real people, uh, leading men's um, uh, Tennessee Williams and Frank Below, and Age of Light is Lee Miller and Man Ray. So, you know, because their char her char their characters are all real human beings, they have a lot more eyes to dot and T's to cross as far as making sure wow, that they don't rewrite right. the actual history of the human beings that actually lived. I don't have that problem. Uh, that, that much of the history of the man who uh, would have inspired the legend of King Arthur, again, there's five or six or seven different candidates for who that person could be, so there, I was not held to that to that same uh, standard, plus the person, whomever it was, was not as well documented um, in history because of the lack of, of sure. um, documentation of anything, really, at that time. Well, any of you have questions that you would like to ask? You're all stunned into no, no, you're never stunned. Okay. <laughs> I have one. Um, how did you decide where to start your research? Uh, thank you. The question is, how did I decide where to start my research? Um, that's a great question. I think I started because the original idea for the story came from a story that my father-in-law told me. And it was about a man, and I won't go into the long version of the story. If you're interested, I'll tell you later. But basically, uh, they had a neighbor who uh, was a diver and uh, spent a great deal of time in the British Library researching the old ship's logs from privateer sailings to try to identify the location of to sink the boats that they sunk so that he could go and dive on them and see if the privateers had forgotten any of the gold. Um, he spent hours and hours and days and weeks in the library researching in these old, musty ship's logs. And my father-in-law said that one day, one of these privateers, privateers are basically legalized pirates from the 17th and 18th century. One, of the, one day, a pirate showed up at the library and sat down next to him and started talking to him. And I was just, oh my gosh, that's insane. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. He was like, yeah, he never, he closed up the ship's log and he never went back. And I, I, I that just, so I just start, I just dove in. And so books was kind of the beginning of it. And then I had to sort of construct a narrative once I had an idea of what I wanted to happen, that kind of the central thing that you'll find out when you read the book. Once I once I had that thing in my head, then I kind of constructed a narrative around it. And then the research kind of led me 
along a path, and, it, and I, I always, I, I try to explain to people, the research and the plot development happen, happen simultaneously. Because so many cool little tidbits of information that I didn't consider to be well known at all, and I don't think many people that are read this book will, will, will recognize them either, but they're true. And they, and I was like, oh my God, that's that's incredibly interesting. And so I was like, I gotta incorporate that. So a lot of it is actually was steered by fact that I uncovered during my research. Uh, but it all started with that with that ancient book thing that I heard. And that was that was the beginning of it all. So did your plot then change a that, little as you went? So through it? imagine if you will, writing a book for twelve years. <laughs> I wrote probably eight versions of that book, yes. each different from He's the writing next. writing a book is the reason why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. As, a, as a fellow author. Yes. Uh, that book went, I, I lopped off whole limbs of that tree, of that, of that book. I, tens and hundreds of thousands of words just gone. Uh, and boy, do I wish I had gotten into a workshop or a, a strong edit relationship with someone because I could have saved myself a lot of time. But you know, everything happens as it should and I hope that the book that ended up coming out and and coming into life, that's that's that that book took 12 years to write and took all those digressions that never went anywhere and plots that ended up against a brick wall and I was like, ooh, how did I mess that up and just mm -hmm. cut it out. And Maybe it will accelerate your future books too, having gone through all that. So yeah. you know, absolutely, I, there's I, a learning curve involved. Yes. Yes. You know, you think I've been a journalist for my whole life, and everyone's like, "Well, you're a writer. You could totally just write a novel, right?" No, it is such a different muscle. It's such a different animal. It's such a different way of thinking. It's a different language. It's a different cadence. It's a different. Um, Everything, everything about it is different. The only thing that's the same is that you're still telling a story. That's the only thing that's the same. And so it was such a learning curve. And I have so many people that have helped and encouraged me along the way as I slowly get this thing from idea to book. So uh, don't give up. So what's up next after that in the so follow up? I have another book that's not a Karis book that was another one of those things that I ran into that made me go, I gotta write about that. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard. And it le and it's a true story that has a big gap in the middle of it where something really, really mysterious happens. And we know where it starts and we know where it ends, but we really don't know what happened in the middle and no one really knows. And all the people that do know are dead and they took the secret with them. So that's my next one. That and then I'm can, going back to uh You can to make Paris. it up then. You can I, make up and I'm fill gonna. that hole. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna make it up. Yes. Uh, but it's gonna be based like this is this book is um the my my goal with this book was I wanted it either to be fact to have to, everything in there is either a fact, the predominant theory of a thing, or is completely plausible based on available information. That I wanted everything in this book to be something that did happen, people think happened, or could happen. That's the journalist in you. Right, I know, yeah. sorry. Yeah. No, you shouldn't be sorry at all. I mean, yeah, you know, no. any, uh, fiction can be constructed yeah. along any number of... I, I feel um, like it's, like when there's so much weird out there, yeah. why make stuff up, you know? This Especially <laughs> right now, I know, not true. Anyone else have a question I can ask? So it's time for cookies. Oh, we have, we have oh cookies. sorry, Peter. Um, so without having read the books, I don't know about this mysterious hanging ending. Um, but what? So if you were going to uh, continue in uh, sort of rare, uh, rare manuscripts, rare books, uh, is there any particular other historical period than the Dark Ages that you think would be an intriguing uh, setting for the next? I mean, I'm a huge history fan, so all it's all interesting, but I'm so obsessed with the Dark Ages because it's dark. Like you can paint, you can, so many stories, hap, so many things happen that are, that are so uh, thinly memorialized. Um, it, and, and so there's, it's just like, it's a rich hunting ground for 
for stories. Well, if you're going to stick to Kara, she spent over 20 years. With this is her thing. It exactly. could be a little hard for her to and like. And the great thing is you can make stuff up because there isn't all this documentation. Right. Exactly. So right. you don't need to worry about someone saying, well. And then when you get a, when you get a piece of documentation, which a lot of the stuff that is in this book is based on, you know, a, a, a paragraph in an ancient tome that was written by a monk in Ireland and that connects to something that happened. And, and the reader isn't going to know that that's what's going on there, but I know it. You know, and so I like the fact that I can kind of continue to sort of snatch little factoids from real things that have been really documented um, that give us a tiny little glimpse into what might have been happening back then and then wrap a narrative around it. <laughs> I should read the new Martin Walker. It's interesting that I read these together because it's about an art authenticator. And one of the ways that she authenticates paintings is to go way back into the archives and look at shipping logs and, you know, all kinds of things to see if there's any mention. Um, a lot of it has to do with still trying to repatriate art that was looted. But um, probably well, that sounds probably very is, similar. It is. Um, and I, I'm impressed that Martin, who also is a journalist, um, has been so thorough in um, mentioning the kinds of records and the kinds of things that this gal, you mostly think of art restorers as going, you know, oh look, it's really Gauguin or something just based on the brushwork and all. But really, if you want to authenticate a painting, it's much more complicated and you do need to try to trace its provenance through art. So it's not really any different then, but you, you would enjoy it because that's what you're writing about. So remind me and I will send you an email and tell you it's called The Body in the Castle Well and he debuts it here on June 4th. So it's really interesting. This would be a great moment to say goodbye to our Facebook audience and thank you for joining us for another terrific discussion.